Hello everyone! Today, I would like to discuss the trope of the scythe as a weapon in fantasy settings. The desire to make this video was brought on by Shadowversity's recent video about war scythes being an underappreciated weapon and the quirks of scythes we see in fiction and what historical weapons resemble or replicate them instead. Though it is also something I always wanted to discuss at some point too. So this video is a response to some of the ideas Shad brings up and where I think we can find better alternative explanations of the trope and also about better weapons with scythe-like elements to compare it to. First off, I love Shad and his content and I don't actually disagree with anything he says in his video. I don't dispute anything he says, and if you haven't seen the video in question, I encourage you to go watch the original video, as I will be referring to it at times. Also, if you have a great interest in historical weaponry, medieval history and castles, or a discussion of fantasy fiction tropes, or any of those combined, I highly recommend you check out Shad's channel, as it's easily one of my favorites when it comes to any one of these subjects. Second, I'm not an academically trained historian, I am not nearly as diverse in HEMA as someone like Shad, and therefore I am not nearly as knowledgeable about fighting techniques, balancing weight distribution, and biomechanics in combat. I can only share what knowledge I have accumulated over my lifelong interest in the weapons found throughout history. So what is this video actually about if I don't disagree with Shad? Despite not disagreeing with Shad, I do feel that there is a whole avenue never actually explored when discussing historical scythe and sickle weaponry. A lot of the discussion focuses primarily on these kinds of weapons in Europe, and naturally the direct comparison between fantasy scythes and the historical war scythe. Often this is where the discussion starts and stops. And I was very pleased to actually see Shad bring something new to the table when he started discussing war picks and the Beck de Corbin and a comparison of it to fantasy sites. It is of course natural that a lot of the historical weapon channels focus on weapons of European history because that is their area of expertise and familiarity and that's not a bad thing in any way. So what I intend to do here is to demonstrate that there are actually better historical analogs to the sites we see in fantasy fiction than war sites and war picks like the Beck de Corbin, and the origin of these analogs will potentially help explain the prevalence of the scythe weapon trope in fantasy fiction, and I think a lot of it has to do with the eastern half of the world. But before we talk about any of that, let's talk about some things Shad mentions in his video that lay some important groundwork for this topic. The part where Shad talks about the agricultural scythe and how it would function if used as a weapon is pretty important. I encourage you to watch him on his own video, but I will summarize here as best I can. So the main problem with the agricultural tool when using it as a weapon is it's kind of a cumbersome shape and the way the blade is angled on the shaft. It's only designed to really be swung a certain way, which is to cut grass, and would need some serious modification if you ever intended to use one on a battlefield or in any type of serious combat scenario. However, there is a historical treatise on fighting with sites, which may or may not be a joke as well. It's suggested that you could get away for the most part with just straightening the shaft and also aligning the blade to come off the shaft at a more 90 degree angle, though there are better modifications that one could make. Shad is absolutely right about all of this. Another key point he makes that I'd like to bring up is when he discusses agricultural tools developing into weapons throughout history. He uses flails that were meant for grain threshing as a good example of this, which developed into flails used for war. The reason I want to bring this up is because a lot of weapons I'm going to show you have their roots in agricultural tools as well, and we are talking about an agricultural tool being a weapon after all. The second reason I want to bring this up is to make a point that just because a tool develops into a weapon one way in the world doesn't necessarily mean that it develops the same everywhere else. To build on Shad's flail example, European flails, the Chinese two-section staff, and the Japanese and Okinawan nunchaku are all descended from agricultural flails, and while they share similarities, they are also very different from each other. Also, sometimes you'll have cases where tools turn into weapons in some parts of the world, while in others they generally don't. For example, the Japanese kunai, while being similar to a dagger, 
actually has its roots in a spade type tool used for digging crops of the same name. As far as I'm aware, there is no war spade equivalent in Western Europe, al although I freely admit I could be incorrect about that. And the last thing he mentions primarily has to do with his comparison between fantasy sides and war picks like the Beck de Corbin. I agree with him that fantasy sides do have much in common with war picks, and if you were to fight with one in actuality, it would involve a lot of stabbing and hooking as opposed to slashing. Some of the weapons I will show you have a lot in common with this concerning techniques using them, and some are even war picks technically. However, one thing that is missing from these comparisons is that signature blade of the scythe having a sharp edge on the underside of the blade that's used for slashing in fantasy fiction. I hope to demonstrate some weapons that show how this could be possible to maintain and often be useful in addition to techniques involving hooking and slashing. Now on to why I think we need to look to the Far East when discussing fantasy sides. When people think of sides in fantasy, they often think of the Grim Reaper, who is usually depicted with a scythe. But it's important to note that in much of European folklore, the Grim Reaper doesn't actually use the scythe as a weapon. It has to do more with symbolism, that he is the harvester of the dead, and this goes all the way back to Greek myth with the gods Kronos and Thanatos, who make the connection between death and time and use metaphors of agriculture to communicate their points. Hence, they too are depicted with scythes, but again, they are not weapons. The scythe itself as a weapon in literature, movies, video games, tabletop games, and such is a very modern trope. And a quick perusal through the TV Tropes page on Sinister Sides, by no means an authoritative source, but still a useful source for reference, you'll notice that the sections on anime and video games greatly dwarf the other sections in comparison. And when you explore these sections, especially with video games, You'll notice that both some of the earliest and also some of the most well-known examples of this trope are video games that come primarily from Japan. Castlevania, Chrono Trigger, Devil May Cry, Mega Man, Soul Calibur, Ninja Gaiden. The trope seems to be very popular in Japan, and I bet if other East Asian countries were also part of the booming video game industry in its early days, then the trope would still persist. And that's not even counting all the anime featuring scythe-wielding characters. This is why I think we need to look to the East rather than the West on this subject. With weapons in general, as you drift from Europe further east, weapons change on a scale starting with not too different to dramatically different depending on the subject. And we don't even need to go that far without finding some forms of weaponry that have traits in common with fantasy sides. The Dacians famously used the Falx polearm, which features a cutting edge on the reverse side of the blade and is very similar to the historical war scythe. The ancient Egyptians made use of a sickle sword known as a kopesh, which does have some aesthetic similarities to agricultural sickles, though also is much more in common with battle axes. The ancient Greeks had a sword known as the kopis, which featured its edge on the underside of the blade, and there were similar weapons to be found in the ancient world from Iberia to Persia. Many cultures that employed chariot warfare made use of scythe chariots, which featured a scythe-like blade mounted on the chariots for running down enemies. In Nepal, you have knives like the kukri, which again features a cutting edge on the reverse side of the blade. But we're gonna hop instead straight to Japan first, because I want to talk about the Kama, a one-handed Japanese weapon that is adapted straight from a farming sickle. The Kama is primarily a martial arts weapon, and Shad himself briefly mentions it in his video. But I think the Kama is a good starting point for this discussion since it is a straight adaptation of an agricultural sickle to a weapon, closely resembles the scythe on an aesthetic level in many ways but its size, and like I said, I think we should be starting with Japan when looking at this trope. In popular culture, the Kama is usually depicted as a weapon of the ninja, but history is a bit more complex than that. Historical ninja, who were very different from the pop culture ninja of today, did indeed make use of the Kama, but probably not as you'd expect. Most of the time it was part of a disguise for the ninja, masquerading as a peasant, or would be used as a general tool while in the field to look or act the part. Where the Kama saw much of its use as a weapon was among the peasant classes of Japan, where it was an improvised weapon that eventually became part of martial arts traditions. Martial arts show us that something as unassuming as a sickle can be quite efficient with certain techniques. Techniques used with the Kama involve a lot of stabbing and hooking, but also using the underside of the blade to slash while hooking. 
Think of it almost like a war pick that you could also cut with. It is also a useful weapon for defending yourself, as you can use it to hook and guide weapons out of the way, and is generally seen wielded as a peer. The Kama was popular enough in Japan that it was eventually combined with other weapons to form hybrids of them, and the same is true in the islands of Okinawa too. The first of which is a fairly sensical weapon, and it is called the Kamayari. So a Yari is a kind of Japanese battlefield spear. The Kamayari takes the sickle blade of the Kama and combines it with the Yari to form a halberd-like weapon, which made use of the sickle blade not only for slashing and stabbing, but much more more as an anti-cavalry and defensive weapon, where it would be used to pull men off of horses and hook weapons pulling them aside so the guy next to you could stab him with his spearhead. Assuming, of course, you couldn't do it yourself. The Kamayari isn't the only Kama hybrid, though it is the most orthodox. The blade of the Kamayari comes in many shapes, but you'll notice that some of them do superficially resemble scythes we see in fantasy fiction, albeit with a smaller blade. More famous than the Kamayari is the Kusarigama or a chain sickle. Again, often shown as a ninja weapon, the Kusarigama was more a traditional martial arts weapon primarily intended for single combat. It is a combination of the Kama with the Japanese chain flail, known as the Kusari Fundo, and it's a hybrid soft weapon that's in the same family as other weapons like the Kyoketsu Shoge and the Rope Dart. While the weighted chain of the Kusarigama would be used for pressuring at long range, with the chain not only hitting hard, but being able to wrap around weapons and limbs, while the Kama part of the weapon was meant more for up-close combat where the chain would be less viable. The Okinawan variant of this took it one step further, where instead of a weighted chain, it's two Kama connected by a chain. Often this would be of shorter length than its Japanese cousin, and would be used in a similar fashion to Nunchaku, which were also popular in Okinawa. So you can kind of already see some of the similarities that the Kama and weapons that are variations of it might have with fantasy sites that we see so often in fiction. And you can also see that the Kama was a popular weapon in Japan, and I think it may have a lot to do why we see European sites featured a lot as weapons in anime and Japanese video games. It's sort of a weird cultural appropriation in a way. To us, a farming sickle or a scythe as a weapon is a little odd because we never really had such a thing in Europe, and when we did make war scythes, they looked nothing like the tool they were based on. But in Japan, where a sickle weapon was very popular to the point that it was readily combined with other weapons, it's a little less outlandish. Now one thing about the Kama I did not tell you is that it was not invented in Japan. In fact, the Kama came to Japan from China and Southeast Asia, and it should absolutely be no surprise to you that we'll find other sickle weapons in these places as well. For instance, Indonesia has the Celerate, which, like the Kama, is a one-handed sickle weapon adapted straight from the farming tool it shares its name with, was commonly used in duels in Indonesia, and there also exist variants of it similar to bill hooks used in medieval Europe. In combat, it uses similar techniques to a Kama, but there is a greater emphasis on slashing and cutting using the edges of the blade. Now China, on the other hand, will give us the weapon closest to a fantasy scythe than anything else in human history, and is also one of humanity's earliest battlefield weapons, a weapon designed strictly for battlefield combat. The weapon in question is the Gur, or Dagger Axe if you prefer. Now there is a contradictory viewpoint on the Dagger Axe's origin. Some historians believe it was actually developed from agricultural sickles, while others contest this and think it was an adaptation of early axes. Either way, the way the dagger axe was used and functions, I think, can illustrate a lot about how a practical fantasy scythe would be if it was proportioned a certain way. The gur consisted of a simple shaft affixed with a protruding blade. The shape of the blade could vary at times. Often it had a curve to it, and this blade could superficially and oftenly resemble a scythe with a pronounced arch. Though there were some that curved upwards and also some that curved downwards, and there were even those with a straight blade. The blade of the dagger axe was much shorter than a scythe blade, but decently long with the first versions being made of stone and copper, before bronze and later iron. 
The blade itself, no matter its shape, had generally the same features. It ended in a sharp point used for stabbing while swinging. The underside of the blade was sharp, and some variants would undoubtedly sharpen both edges, as this is a weapon that was commonly swung in wide motions as part of its techniques. The dagger axe would be used in rather loose formations, since it required decent room to swing around, and this would often be in arching motions that attempted to either pierce an enemy with its point or use one of the sharp edges of the blade to slash and cut things. Common targets were things like legs, arms, waists, necks, anything that was fairly easy to hook the dagger axe's blade around and perform a cutting motion, or something that you could use to latch onto and use to pull and trip your enemies. The dagger axe not only resembles a scythe superficially, but it seems to have more in common with fantasy scythes than even something like the Kamayari has. Of course, it doesn't stop there. The dagger axe eventually fell to the wayside in favor of a hybrid between it and a spear, the Chinese halberd, the G. Now, the G comes in many shapes and sizes, and most are probably more accustomed to the crescent G of later Chinese dynasties. However, the earliest G were simply a dagger axe with a spear blade now positioned at the top, increasing its versatility and killing potential tremendously. Not only could it now be used for stabbing, hooking, and slashing in wide swings, but it could also be used for straight thrusting, which meant that tighter formations were possible, and the G was the signature battlefield weapon of conscripted infantry during the Han Dynasty, for example. Some G even took it a step further, adding an additional dagger axe blade, having two scythe-like blades for hooking and stabbing. There also existed hand-and-a-half and, and one-handed versions of the G. Some famous warriors of Chinese history reportedly wielded peers of them. It's hard not to look at a dagger axe sometimes and just think how it looks like the scythe we're familiar with from video games and anime. If anything, I think it's certainly the closest historical comparison you can find to fantasy scythes. And this phenomena could also be found in places like India, for example. Though much later on, with the war pick known as a Zagnal. It's a hard weapon to find information on, but it did come in many shapes, including a battle axe-like one, but also a scythe-like one, as seen by this example. So coming back full circle, the trope of fantasy scythes, while not necessarily invented by the East, certainly seems more common in the media from there, and I think it has a lot to do with the simple fact that sickles quite commonly became weapons in East Asia, while in places like Europe, they generally didn't. The scythe itself has never been an actual weapon, but there have been many weapons throughout history that have shared many similarities with it. Well guys, I hope you found the information dump here entertaining at the least. Maybe you learned something new, maybe you think I'm full of crap. Tell me what you think. Do you think this could really be why the trope is so common in fantasy video games? Because obviously after many decades of it appearing in Japanese fantasy games and also Japanese anime, it's kind of just been absorbed into contemporary fantasy by now. Like the katana, for example. Feel free to tear me a new one if you think I'm all wrong too. But first and foremost, please go check out Shad's channel, I can't recommend him enough. Anyway, I'll see you all next time.